It's really my honor and privilege now to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, Representative Rush Holt of New Jersey. Congressman Holt is not only a member of Congress, he is a distinguished physicist. In fact, he's the only physicist in the US Congress. Before becoming a representative of central New Jersey in 1999, he taught at Swarthmore College from 1980 to 1988, and then served as assistant director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, the largest research facility at Princeton and the largest center for research in alternative energy in New Jersey. He also has a patent for a solar energy device that he invented. Congressman Holt's extensive research on alternative energy makes him an extraordinarily valuable member of Congress. Our young scientists know how important and complicated these issues are. Representative Holt serves on the Committee on Education and the Workforce and the Committee on Natural Resources, where he is ranking minority member on the Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources. This group helps to develop a long-term strategy to decrease our nation's dependence on fossil fuels and protect our environment for future generations. Dr. Holt also served on the National Commission on Mathematics and Science Teaching for the 21st Century, chaired by former Senator and astronaut John Glenn. At SSP, we are particularly proud that Congressman Holt is a longtime reader of our magazine, Science News. But perhaps most important, Congressman Holt was a five-time champion on Jeopardy. <laughs> Even more impressive, he was the first human being to finally beat the computer Watson at the game. And who says congressmen are only good at politics? <laughs> Congressman Holt is one of the country's most important science leaders. We are honored that he has taken the time to come and speak with students this evening. We think that his being here demonstrates his commitment to making sure that today's middle school students will be able to pursue the best possible science education and careers in the world right here in the US. Please join me in welcoming Representative Rush Holt of New Jersey. Well, thank you very much. It is my honor to be here. Uh, hello, uh, contestants. Uh, you have accomplished a lot already, and I am delighted to get to know some of you. I look forward to getting to know all of you, uh, and I, I congratulate you. Um, it is um, important to you individually, but this is really important to our society. And uh, you are carrying a mantle in a way that I hope is fun and not burdensome for you, uh, but it really is important. And I want to thank uh, Elizabeth Marincola uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, she's been a leader in, in biomedical research funding, um, work uh, with that uh, was active in the American Society for Cell Biology and uh, now is uh, doing so much with the Society for Science and the Public. Uh, you know, when, when she asked me to do this, I didn't know what the master's was now or is, and now I know why, because it's brand new. Uh, you are paving the way, but by all accounts, uh, you have, have taken this already to... Uh, a very high level, and uh, that's terrific. You know, I thank the Society for hosting the program. Uh, I thank Broadcom for conceiving it and, and carrying it forward. Um, on a personal note, I, I will reiterate what Elizabeth said. I'm an avid reader of science news. In fact, people ask, well, how can you be a politician and a scientist? And I recall uh, that in the seventh grade, close to your age, I had my own subscription to Science News and the Washington Post. <laughs> and <laughs> so I clearly was, um, I, I, I clearly saw no division between science and all of those other things that make 
make uh, life important. Um, as a former science teacher, I particularly want to thank the teachers who guided you, and of course, many of the parents are here, and I know, having um, worked with kids, uh, our own and, and others, uh, science fair projects are usually not entirely independent, and so I thank you for the guidance that, that you have provided. Um, in 1957, the Soviet Union launched a satellite known as Sputnik. Uh, it was a tiny little grapefruit-sized uh, satellite, and all it did was go beep, beep, beep on the radio. Uh, but it sent terror through the United States that somehow we were going to be overrun by the Soviet Union. And in response, uh, Congress uh, passed, a, passed legislation that was based on the goal that we were going to be the greatest nation in science and engineering. We were going to produce a generation of scientists and engineers the likes of which the world has never seen, and we did. But one of the problems was we said science is for scientists, and we left behind about 80% of the population who didn't want to be scientists, and so we told them, well, you don't need to do science. If you're going to be a lawyer, if you're going to be in a, a, a trader on Wall Street or maybe a member of Congress, you don't need to know science. What a shame. We have to address that problem that still lingers with us, and you are in a perfect position to address that. First of all, we have to understand and help everybody understand that scientists, science makes us well-rounded, makes a person well-rounded. Science is not at all limiting. I don't doubt that some of you will not be professional scientists. You will develop other interests as you go along, and that's just great. But I would bet, now that you've been recognized for your science work, you won't lose your interest in science. You won't be afraid of science. You won't say, well, let's leave these scientific questions to the scientists. You won't say, well, I'm not in a position to judge whether climate change is the result of human activity and whether it's, whether it's going to be expensive in lives or money. Uh, even if you are not a scientist, you will be able to think intelligently about such issues. You know, Mark Twain, the writer, uh, you know him through Tom Sawyer, maybe, or Huckleberry Finn, or others. Uh, he once quipped, uh, there's a remarkable thing about science. You get such a wholesale return of conjecture on such a trifling investment of fact. <laughs> well, he was, of course, jesting. He was making fun of science. But he was awfully close to the mark. It is wonderful in science that you can go so far in your thinking based on what you have observed. Today's Nobel Prize that says the universe, uh, the, there are three researchers who discovered that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate. It's not as if there was once a Big Bang and now the universe is just uh, expanding and gradually slowing down. No, it's speeding up. How do we know that? Well, because of work that scientists did by taking a prism and looking at a candle flame. So through that simple experiment, they understood how to break light into its component colors, find out what elements were there, and then subsequently find out actually how fast those elements were moving. A wholesale return of conjecture for a trifling investment of fact. But there was fact. And that's the point I want to leave you with. Thinking like a scientist is probably the skill that 
students most need to learn, and especially if they are not going to become professional scientists. Thinking like a scientist means you're able to ask a question in a way that the question can be answered with evidence and answered in a way that other people can check your work. Both of those are key. It has to be grounded in observation or experiment, and it has to be communicated in a way. And all of you have written essays, you've honed your scientific communication, and I hope you will hone it further. It has to be communicated in such a way that other people can understand it and check your work and, in fact, try to show you that you're wrong. And if enough people try to show you that you're wrong and fail to do so, then what you have observed comes to be known as a fact. Well, that way of thinking is valuable for our society, for answering the policy questions that this country faces, and it's also invaluable in your life. Because one of the lessons you will learn is that the easiest person in the world to fool is yourself. You will think something is true. In fact, you will be so sure that something is true, you'll be tempted to look for evidence to confirm what you already believe and fool yourself further. But if you carry the lessons you've learned here of thinking like a scientist, you will have the invaluable skill of being able to check yourself. That's the essence of science. That's why from Galileo to this day, what came from science is so reliable. What comes from science improves our lives. What comes from science leads us into the future. You have developed that skill, and you can communicate that skill to all of those people, your classmates, who think they are afraid of science or can't do science. And you will have get, gotten the satisfaction of helping those kids, but you will have performed a national service. I thank Broadcom for putting you on this route, um, and uh, I wish uh, all of you well. Uh, you've already, whether or not you're selected as the outstanding student tonight, you've already accomplished a great deal, and you are very well positioned to accomplish a great deal more in the rest of your lives. Thanks.